Welcome to another episode of Inflection. I am Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. Hello, Angelo. How are you doing? Hi, Brian. Doing great. Thank you. Okay, great to have you here. Uh, we're going to need your expertise. We're going to be talking about uh, a couple of different things, all related, but the main topic is going to be China in Afghanistan. What are they? What are they doing in Afghanistan right now? What do they want to do? And what is the U.S. going to try to do to to stop it? Because of course they're going to. Uh, and uh, before we get into that, there's a couple of other directly related news stories because all of this is all about. Some people call it U.S.-China competition, but I would say that this is actually a conflict, and uh, well, maybe we'll see in just um, just a moment why that might be. But uh, here, here are these U.S.-backed protests in Thailand. So, so what the U.S. is doing is trying to encircle and contain China, and they're doing this by destabilizing all of China's partners in the region, in in Asia, uh, along its periphery. And so they're doing that in Thailand. Thailand right now has a very close relationship with China, biggest trade partner. Uh, China is their biggest investor, biggest source of tourism, cooperating across military and infrastructure spheres. And they're building a high-speed rail line from Kuming to, to Bangkok through Laos. And so they're stirring up trouble to stop this. And here's Al Jazeera, and people need to keep in mind, Al Jazeera is Qatari state media, and they go along with the U.S. on everything, just about. So Thailand, thousands joined Bangkok rally demanding PM's re resignation. And what happened was, uh, we're recording this on a Sunday, so yesterday they, they voted in parliament. It was a no confidence vote against the prime minister, and he passed. He passed. Nobody was, nobody's going to be voting him out except the, the U.S.-backed opposition, and they didn't have the numbers. And in the lead up to that, they were staging these protests. Now, you look at this picture, even in this picture, Angelo, does that look like thousands to you? Like, you know, when you say thousands, you think like three, three, four thousand or more, right? Up, up to 10,000. Now, and they pick a picture like this instead of like an aerial view to really show the numbers because they don't have the numbers. And if you look at this picture, which is taken from above, this is the whole protest. So this is the intersection and the stage right here. There's the MRT station. And you can see right across from the MRT station and the corner of this building, that's where it stops. And then right over here is the other MRT station. So that's all that showed up. That's not even a thousand people, not even a thousand. Al Jazeera is saying thousands. Angela, why do you think Al Jazeera is trying to artificially inflate the numbers they don't know how to count or they're doing this deliberately well it's just deliberate uh i i saw it alive it was uh, just a few hundred uh, well you, you have to keep in mind that this was like asok area a very busy intersection in in bangkok and uh, probably half of the people were just by, bystanders why because you're putting music you put a, a concert on and it's a busy area, so you, of course you are going to have bystanders. So at most, like just a few hundred protesters. Uh, I think it's interesting to see, like, uh, to follow those Western uh, Western media uh, because sometimes they are advanced indicators. So they make it sound big. Uh, this this protest when it's a non-event. So we need to ask the questions: What is behind this? Why why are they propping up something which is a, a non-event? Exactly. And of course, the reason is uh, these protests in Thailand, in Myanmar, in Malaysia, as they were in Hong Kong, they're U.S. backed and they want to try to make them seem as big and as powerful as possible because the goal is to create maximum destabilization, possibly get a client regime into power. But short of that, just stirring up as much trouble as possible. And if uh, Al Jazeera and the local media, if they said uh, dwindling protest, uh, not even a thousand showed up. If they said how big the population of Bangkok was, 12 to 14 million people, and then this is all that showed up, people would start putting the pieces of the puzzle together and say, this movement has no public support. Uh, and, and then it would fall apart. And the, their job is to keep it going long after ex expiration date. The next, the next story we're going to talk about is, is about Kamala Harris in Vietnam. So last week, 
uh, Angela, we talked about Singapore. Uh, this week, we're, let's talk about what Kamala Harris was doing in Vietnam. But before we, before we do that, I just wanna set the stage here. Uh, where did Vietnam export to in 2019? So this is the Atlas of Economic Complexity from Harvard University. It's a very useful tool. It's got a timeline down here so you can see how this has changed over time. But number one export market for Vietnam is China. And then when you add Hong Kong to it, and you should, because it's they're integrated, uh, it's almost a quarter of their trade goes to China. And then the United States is number two, and that's all about a fifth almost of, so that's a significant export market. Vietnam wouldn't want to jeopardize either one of these. This is very important to their economy. And then when we look at imports, uh, China alone uh, dwarfs all of these regions combined, Europe, North America, South America, Australia, and, and everyone else. Uh, so China is Vietnam's largest, most important trade partner. So when you see a headline like this, Harris urges Vietnam to join U.S. in opposing China bullies. It would be like, I'm asking you to push your business partner down the stairs. Do you want to do that? Uh, Angela, what do you what do you think? Just seeing this headline, what what do you think about well, this? Won't, uh, Vietnamese won't be fooled. You, you saw what happened in Ukraine. Ukraine was a, a great partner of Russia and for a long time, for centuries, and it dropped it dropped Russia in favor of the U.S. and EU. And what happened? Did the EU and U.S. both you know like lifted the economy of Ukraine? No, it just dropped it, dropped Ukraine. Ukraine now is is going to lose three billion U.S. dollar of transit fees because of Nord Stream two. The the U.S. the Russia is going to bypass Ukraine and and is going to 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 sell its gas to directly to Germany. So you see, they just uh, uh, Vietnam is not going to be used like other countries. Uh, it's no fault. You know, the, in in Asia, there's a saying that uh, you need to favor better a close friend than the distant than the relative that is living far away. So your neighbor is much more important than a distant relative because, because you have to live on a daily basis with your neighbor. The US, how many miles away it is? How much influential? And, and, and again, the, the facts are that the uh, US is in decline. Do you want to follow the US or do you want, do you, do you want to follow history? And history is showing that China is not an emerging power. It's re-emerging. China is only taking back its original uh, position it had for centuries, thousands of years. Um, yeah, really good point. Um, and people should remember that Vietnam had rocky relations with both the U.S. and China. But, okay, so the U.S., the war the U.S. waged on Vietnam was obviously many times more devastating than the botched Chinese invasion of Vietnam. Uh, but when we look at China then and the US then, and then China now and the US now, China's a completely different country. After Mao Zedong passed away, a lot of reform took place. You, you, it's not even really fair to say that it's the same China with the same motivations and method of operation. The US is exactly the same or actually even worse now than it was when it was just carpet bombing Vietnam for 20 years. And, and so I think Vietnam will keep all of that in mind. Uh, and then when you go through this article, you will see the first three paragraphs is the US complaining about the China in the South China Sea. Now, is the US a claimant in the South China Sea? No, it has to cross an entire ocean just to stick its nose in, in this, this issue. And uh, I like to show people this map because this map highlight something very important that the United States never mentions. It's not just China having a dispute with uh, Vietnam or the Philippines or Malaysia or Indonesia. All of these countries have disputes with each other over the South China Sea. This is multiple overlapping disputes. And that's what they are. They're just disputes. We've talked about this before where uh, England and France have disputes over fishing waters. They don't go to war. Sometimes the rhetoric gets heated, but then they bilaterally uh, overcome them 
and patch up relations. And that's what happens in the South China Sea all the time. Uh, and what the US is doing, it's inserting itself into these minor disputes and trying to inflate them into a regional, if not international conflict. And because no one is having it, they have to bring in Japan, Australia, India, even England and France, they have to bring them in because no one in the region that's actually a claimant in, in these disputes wants to be a part of this. So that's the number one thing uh, the US wants Vietnam to sign up for, turning normal disputes into a conflict with Vietnam's largest trade partner. And they say things about um, COVID-19, they're donating vaccines, um, basically vaccines that were gonna expire anyway. And then let's see, what was the other thing? Clean energy, clean energy. Uh, so that's about the US trying to stop Vietnam from building more coal plants with China and build liquid natural gas plants instead. And then they need to import US liquid natural gas to Vietnam, again, crossing an entire ocean and it's going to be more expensive. So this is this is what the US is offering Vietnam. Uh, any Anything you wanna add on to this, Angela, before I go on to where Vietnam stands with all of this with China? Well, I can see that the US has no vision. Uh, look at what it is doing. It's coming up with, the, with some uh, version of the Belt and Road initi Initiative, uh, but not, nothing is factual. There's no plan, there's no, in terms of size, it's gonna be much uh, smaller. So there's no vision. It's about copying and, and trying to, to, to be better than, than China. Why, why would you want to do, to, to do that? I mean, uh, uh, and again, why uh, there are so many internal problems already in the U.S.? Why don't you start uh, taking care of your own problems in the U.S.? I mean, you know, be, before trying to to improve uh, improve other countries and bring uh, supposedly those uh, um, you know freedom, democracy, human rights. I mean, take care of your human rights back at home. And and while the U.S. is offering Vietnam all of these kind of rotten already already bitten carrots, they also have the stick. And that comes in the form of National Endowment for Democracy funded opposition groups that protest inside Vietnam. They try to stir up nationalists to put pressure on the government regarding China. Uh, but let's take a look at, let's take a look at what China isn't, isn't offering Vietnam. They've already implemented this. This is already happening. So this is from uh, Xin Hua, China-Europe freight train marks first connection between Zhangzhou, Hanoi, and Liege, and this is in uh, Belgium. And so what's, what is this? This is China with its Belt and Road Initiative, the, the new Silk Road. It's a rail line that goes through China, across Russia, and into Europe. And now they've connected Vietnam to this, this freight line. And now Vietnam has another option when they want to export. And I mean, if we go back to here and we look at uh, exports, Europe, act, I think Europe actually used to be uh, the second largest export market for Vietnam way, way back when, like maybe back, let's go back to the nineties. Yeah, it used to be the second largest export market and now it's not. So this, this rail line that China is giving Vietnam access to is going to help them sell more products to Europe and vice versa. And also every country that the line passes through on its way to Europe, these are new potential markets for Vietnam and shipping freight by rail is cheaper than sending it by ship and also faster in, in some instances. Uh, and this is this is the article from Vietnam News, the National English Language Daily. The link to this will be in the video description. They kind of give some of the details. It's not a massive, it's not a massive operation. It's the first, you know, the first run, trial run. And this is something that's going to expand gradually over time. Angela, what do you think about this? Uh, when you compare this to the US trying to pressure Vietnam into buying liquid natural gas from the other side of the planet, I mean, what do you, how do you compare and contrast? Well, it's uh, first of all, it's more expensive, and then uh, it's not it's not ecological. It's the same as uh, the U.S. wanted to sell uh, liquefied uh, gas to Germany, 
while Germany could just buy from Russia and using a pipeline. Using a pipeline is more ecological. So it's, it's in contradiction with the sustainable development and, and the transition. Uh, um, so so it's, it's just uh, just hypocrisy and why it's just, you know, you need to be pragmatic. Why would I want to buy uh, more expensive gas? And, and again, you need to, to diversify supply. You know, uh, so China, China is doing the same. It's not, it's not putting all its eggs in the same basket. And and what do you think about uh, China hooking Vietnam up to this uh, China Europe freight line? Uh, well, you, you know, the, the freight line makes uh, makes complete uh, absolutely sense. Uh, freight line, the uh, one of the advantages uh, to cut the lead time. The lead time is cut by ten to fifteen days. So. Uh, just uh, it doesn't apply. Actually, it's, it's, it might be slightly more expensive than sea freight. Uh, depending on which country you, you, you're sending your goods to, uh, you have a. It's either only sea freight or you have sea freight plus land. And the land actually costs a lot when it's when it's by truck, when it's by uh, by rail, it's cheaper. So here it's a, it's more like a diversify uh, diversify routes because because it's it's always good to have an alternative uh between um, between sea routes and and, uh, and land routes and also lead time lead time is important you know you actually making the the trades uh closer you know you it's a rapprochement of countries in eurasia uh so it's important that you they, they diminish like the lead time you know it's 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 enormous when you think about 10 15 days uh, for for high um, high value goods, it's extremely important. Exactly, and also for supply chains that that order things on short notice. I mean, having having a shorter travel time for those parts means much more flexibility. Uh, so so again, it's the U.S. making all of these promises, and they're not even even on paper. They're not really good looking promises. And then here is China just hooking Vietnam up to this freight line, and it's already being used. And you could say you know, 23 containers on one trip, big deal. But that's that's already being done right now. It's not on paper. It's something that they're doing and it's capacity that they're going to build out over time. And this is what China has been doing for the last couple of decades. That's how it suddenly, suddenly it's such a big issue because China does these things very gradually, very patient, patiently. And then finally, there's like this critical mass that it reaches and then suddenly the US decides to start panicking. And um, let us go to, and Angela, you, I, I was already, I already did a video on this and then you sent me that other article and I just thought this is a really important news piece to go over, the terrorism in Myanmar. And Angela, you and I, when we were talking about the situation in Myanmar, I think we started as soon as it started in February, uh, people said, "Oh, you got it all wrong. And these are real. These are real pro protesters. They're real, you know, people power and pro democracy. And you're a tanky. And you're, and and I said, no, they're violent. They're terrorists. And it, just give it time, and all the truth will come out. And Myanmar now is not Myanmar state media. It's not Chinese or Russian state media." It's opposition media funded by the U.S. government through the National Endowment for Democracy. We've gone over that many times. And this is an entire article about these people's defense forces bragging about how they murdered six railway police. So they're on the train just to make sure the train is a safe place for people. And they went on the train and they killed these six men and they stole their weapons and they're bragging about it. Um, they show the, the dead police officer, they show the terrorists bragging about how they took his weapon and all these other weapons. Um, there's a couple of really telling, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, Angela, what, when you first read this article, uh, what were you thinking? Well, this is nothing, nothing less than a terrorist. Uh, again, uh, they're not even killing uh, militaries. I mean, they're killing uh, civil servants. Uh, we're talking about mayors, uh, uh, town, town village leaders. Uh, so, so it's just it's just terrorism. Uh, it's, uh, and then, um, so so I wouldn't be surprised that PDF, this uh, this entity, this terrorist entity, will be in, uh, listed as a terrorist uh, entity because it, it's nothing else, nothing else. 
And let's let's see what the, the, the guy who's bragging about this to Myanmar now, let's see what he himself says. And again, people have to remember, this is opposition media. I know we're gonna have comments in the comment section saying you're you're funded by Myanmar military. This is the opposition media. This is, has nothing to do with the military. Um, so they're saying, according to La Pie Juan, uh, that means that anyone in uniform who continues to work for the junta, including traffic police, firefighters, and even Red Cross workers is fair game. That is just, the, this is the people defense force admitting that they're going to violate the Geneva Conventions. They're not even, they're obviously they're doing that, but they're also saying that they're doing it as a matter of po deliberate policy that they're going to just murder anyone cooperating with the government. And we've talked about this before, um, not this one, this one, this was back in June. This was when the PDF uh, terrorists were attacking schools. And uh, there was this Reuters article here where the, the teachers uh, are so afraid that they go to school in normal clothing and change in their uniforms only inside the school. Now, when we see uh, him saying that anyone in uniform is going to die, now we know why the teachers change their, their clothes at school and they don't wear their uniform in public. Because the US-backed pro-democracy protesters will gun them down, will murder them just for thinking differently than them. That doesn't sound like democracy to me. Uh, and then there's this one, attackers in Yangon kill suspected military informant, then detonate bombs when junta forces arrive to investigate. The killer said the targeted Tin Mong Win because he had people arrested for their alleged role in torching Chinese factories. So this was something else we said was going on and everyone denied. Yes, they're torching Chinese factories because they're US-backed opposition. They hate China, even though it makes absolutely no sense. It's not in Myanmar's best interests, but this is the nature of uh, uh, an imperial proxy. This is what they do. They will destroy their own country. They will cut their own wrists and they will bleed themselves out. And uh, if you come down here, this is what they say to Myanmar now, the newspaper, the opposition newspaper. We shot him four times and planted three bombs for the dogs but only two of them detonated. And then they are, they're just talking about uh, how he deserved to die. He posed no threat to them. He just had different political views. He was cooperating with the government and they opposed the government, so they murdered him. This sounds exactly like the, the terrorists in Syria. Angela, do you remember uh, before it became obvious that they were all ISIS and Al Qaeda, how, how the Western media would tell these kind of stories and people would say, don't, I mean, doesn't that sound like terrorism? And they would deny it up and down. Uh, how does this strike you, these two stories? It's the same, uh, the same model, the same playbook. Uh, additional to that, they, they, they're actually asking for R2P, uh, responsibility to protect. So they, they, um, it's a sort of freezing of accounts. There's a government in exile. It's the same thing. It's the same, uh, you know, you can draw many parallels like in, in Venezuela, Juan Guaido. They have the, the same in, in Myanmar. And keeping in mind that for people that don't understand uh, Myanmar's oppositions, this, this movement uh, led by Han San Suu Kyi, it's a movement that has been hijacked completely by the U.S. through the National Endowment for Democracy, Open Society of Soros. And what the media is uh, doing right now in, in Myanmar is is restoring sovereignty because again, you know, we repeat it over and over, you cannot have democracy if you don't have sovereignty. So it's a preconditions. Uh, so the first thing that, that Myanmar that needs to do is having stronger national security laws and getting getting the the, the communication, getting get, because the well the all the medias uh, have been have been funded by by uh, the US. So this uh, this communication here, we're just bringing an alternative to mainstream media by doing some research and just uh, stating facts. Actually, most of the of the news we are giving is we're using actually uh, U.S. backed media like Myanmar Myanmar now. It's actually very difficult because they they are actually saying that uh, they're putting bombs, but and, and then they uh, after that they they even saying that they are freedom fighters. I mean, how can you do that? How can you put bombs into schools and call yourself a freedom fighter? It's it, you are a terrorist. Uh, they what the achievement so far when it comes to schools is twenty five percent of kids are not going to school. I mean, how good does it do to your country?
How good does it do to your country? When you ask it for foreign intervention, what, what go good does it do to your country? I mean, those kids that are actually backing foreign intervention, they should learn about history. I mean, they, you know, it's, uh, it, they, Myanmar, I mean, before it was Burma, again, it's independence, you know, and it's, it's, it was a hard fought independence. Why are you asking? you know, for interference, uh, you know, for any uh, intervention doesn't make any sense. It's just ridiculous. So it's, it's again, you know, Myanmar is another country that had never actually gained its independence. Remember, you know, when, when they actually give you independence, they, they're leaving uh, the seeds of revolutions. You know, it's like glad your operation. It's the same as what is happening in, in Afghanistan. Don't believe that uh, the U.S. is leaving without planting the seeds for Disruption, disruption is going to be terrorist. It's going to be all those NGOs. Imagine those fundings yeah, with millions of dollars in poor countries, developing countries. It goes a long, long way. Um, absolutely. And that was that's a perfect springboard into our main topic about how the, U the U.S. is leaving behind a, a mess in Afghanistan. Uh, but you, you said these youths need to study history, even if they don't find history interesting or appealing. They could just look at current events, look at what the U.S. did to Afghanistan, how they left Afghanistan. Can't they see themselves handing their baby up to, to U.S. Marines trying to get them on the last plane out of Kabul? Can't they see that? Can't they see what the U.S. has done and that nothing that they say or do is, is said in good faith, how they are using, abusing, exploiting, and then discarding absolutely everyone, including their, their own, the way they treat their own people uh, in the process of all this, the way those Marines died in the last days in Kabul, totally unnecessary. Uh, and um, one one point I wanted to make about uh, these this um, this last one that you you sent right before the show, uh, where they're attacking the Chinese factories. This is why I say it's not really U.S. Chinese competition. This is a conflict. Uh, this is the same as if the U.S. just had B fifty twos rolling over Myanmar, bombing Chinese factories. Uh, the difference is we're in the 21st century, uh, just like you said, Angela, they have the, the way of manipulating people through social media, through the media, and, and transforming these people into weapons of mass destruction. As a matter of fact, Angela, do you remember the BBC uh, segment on the Oslo Freedom Forum and how they said they, they basically transformed those Hong Kong activists into weapons of mass destruction to ruin Hong Kong. We've been told many of Hong Kong's demonstrators were trained long before taking to the streets to use non-violent action, as they describe it, as a weapon of mass destruction. Protesters were, uh, were, were taught how to behave during a protest, so how to keep ranks, how to uh, speak to police. Um, how to uh, manage their own movement, how to use marshals within their movement. So these are people who are specially trained. There's also, you know, how to behave when arrested. Uh, you know, practical things like the need for food and water, you know, um, that uh, movement can last longer when people are taken care of. And also how to manage a water cannon being used against you and other types of police violence. It's meticulous. Absolutely. This is what they've done in Myanmar. They don't need to, to, to use B-52s. They could have these terrorists burn down the Chinese factories that way. It's a, it's a much more cost-effective uh, way to do it. It's cheaper politically, uh, less risky for the United States to do it in this very indirect manner. And so this is why I say the US and China are already at conflict with one another. The, the US is doing it through proxies. They are along China's peripheries destroying Chinese property, attacking Chinese nationals, what they're doing in uh, Western Pakistan, for example, in Baluchistan, trying to kill the Chinese ambassador, attacking infrastructure, killing engineers. Uh, this, is, this is a conflict. And inside China, the whole Xinjiang issue is, is exactly the same. So uh, maybe we go into our main topic here, which is what, what is China doing in Afghanistan and what is the US going to do to stop them? Now I got this, I don't know if people have ever seen this building, but this is actually the, this is called Chinatown in Kabul. And it's this kind of like a complex 
and Chinese companies occupy this complex. And this is where they're doing business in Afghanistan right now. They import Chinese goods and they sell it to people in Afghanistan. And this is supposed to be kind of a center where they expand out. And a lot of Chinese investors and businessmen and business people in general, they come here to do this. Uh, so this is in Kabul right now already. Um, let's see, there were some articles that you also sent, Angelo. Do you want to talk about uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in, in Afghanistan? Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, you, uh, just going back to the picture you you showed just before. I mean, the Chinese. You know, the Chinese didn't weigh the Taliban for starting doing business with Afghanistan and putting the the foundation for rebuilding Afghanistan. It started already uh, a while ago. Uh, so 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 now uh, we have um, there are, we have uh, what is interesting about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is which is a kind of. A, uh, a counterbalance somehow a counterbalance to nato you know with the difference that you have uh, india inside it's interesting maybe india might be playing both sides and and, and i think it's a good option also for india but uh, there are actually talks about afghanistan uh, joining a ceo and additional to that actually iran is going to join a ceo what is interesting also, if you look at the composition of SEO, is um, is all Eurasia, and it's uh, mainly helping those countries which are landlocked. You know, all those, especially when it comes to all those uh, USSR uh, countries that um, that that are completely landlocked, and they need the Belt and Road Initiative in order to develop. So it's a, it's a, I would say it's a, it's the version of the Belt and Road Initiative for Eurasia, but more like for for security purpose. Uh, so you see, there there is a, there are talks about the, this Cold War, this uh, between China and, and the USA. But in reality, there are facts on the ground. When when you see that in Afghanistan, they already. Start uh, the Chinese already started a few years ago, starting to 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 build the business. Well, it, it's showing you that that there's a you know the the on the ground trade. The, the we need to look at trades and uh, um, and business, and and that is showing actually the advanced indicators for what is going to happen. So now, when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, there's a few things that are interesting. Is that you see. Uh, how much the U.S. and the West cares about Afghanistan? They're cutting the aid of the IMF and the World Bank, completely cutting the aid. Keep in mind that the aid in Afghanistan amounts for forty percent of Afghanistan GDP. So, how much do you care about Afghanistan when you're cut, completely cutting the aid of Afghanistan? Uh, then they are actually taking nine billion U.S. dollar. They're just blocking nine billion U.S. dollar that are in the U.S. banks. How much do you care about Afghanistan when you're blocking this money, which is which is extremely important for Afghanistan? So now it, it, this is a stage where the West is actually choking Afghanistan. Taliban took over. Now we are going to choke Afghanistan. And additional to that, uh, don't believe that the U.S. is leaving without putting the seeds for disruption. You know, we saw we saw it over and over. Gladio operation in World War II was the same. You leave behind agents for disruption. You don't you think don't don't believe that twenty years of presence in Afghanistan is going to to be like left? Uh, they're going to leave alone Afghanistan like this? No, no, no. There are seeds for disruptions. It, it can come in many different forms. CIA agents. Uh, all the NGOs that are still going to be there, you know, USA, they, they, they'll be active and they'll create disruption. And it's not going to help uh, Afghanistan. You know, it's, it's going to be, they, they are going to target many different aspects of Afghani society. It can be, uh, well, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, it can be the civil society, it can be, it can be uh, uh, giving arms to, to Masood in the pan, Panjshir, you know. Uh, so Afghanistan is not, it's not over. Don't believe it's over. And uh, I think that that point about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, because because you're you're basically saying that the U.S. is going to create security crises inside of Afghanistan, around Afghanistan, 
and everywhere else where they're already doing it, like in, in Western Pakistan. Uh, and so maybe uh, membership in the SCO can give Afghanistan the resources that it needs to actually really stabilize the country versus what the US was doing, which was just occupying it. And, and they had this artificial order that they put into place that they never intended to endure once they left. And uh, you're talking about freezing uh, assets and withdrawing aid. And this is, you know, what does that do? What does poverty and ignorance do? It breeds extremism. So they are, they're setting the, they're setting the stage to create this extremism. Uh, let's see, uh, I want to show people, I think it's um, this one. So this is actually where China and Afghanistan meet. They share a border, a very small border. And through this pass, uh, there's a lot of speculation about China building a corridor through here, trans transportation and economic corridor through here into Afghanistan. Um, and what I kind of want to, one point I kind of want to make, and let's see if you agree with this or not, or have something to add to it. U.S. reconstruction in Afghanistan did not work because they had these contractors coming in from the U.S. They give them these contracts. They don't care if the project is even completed or not. And then once it's completed, they don't care what happens to it. They leave Afghanistan, uh, they go back and spend their money somewhere else. And then if the project doesn't fail, that's actually even better for them because then they could come back and get another contract to, to rebuild it or, or come up with another alternative for that failed project. The difference with China is that they're there to actually do business. They live in Afghanistan. They are trying to build businesses in Afghanistan. Some of these articles, and again, they're all going to be linked to in the video description below, and they all come from Western sources. So there's going to be bias in them, but there's also a lot of really good points that are made. They're planning on building power plants. There's projects there that need power plants to, to operate because there's uh, shortages of energy. And this is something that, uh, you know, the Taliban or whoever's going to be in the government, they're going to want to build that power plant. Actually, before the Taliban came in, China was doing business with the other government, the US backed government, and they wanted China to build the power plant and China wants to build the power plant. So this is why it's going to get done versus why 20 years of reconstruction for the US disappeared almost literally overnight. And so the only thing that's going to complicate or impede China, and they, they talk about this mining operation, a copper mine, that China invested in and how no progress has been made. Why not? Because of security issues. It's They're trying to demine the, the location where they're going to do their mining. So demine, I mean, the explosives used in war, not the mine where you extract resources. So it's security problems that are hindering development in Afghanistan. And the US is going to do everything in their power to, to compound those security crises to impede Chinese uh, investments and development in Afghanistan. Uh, Angelo, anything, anything you want to add to that? Um, just about the SEO. What is interesting about SEO is just uh, it's uh, there's uh, in in the goal. It's uh, it's stated that uh, there's a respect for uh, the cultures and also non-interference and in, of uh, internal affairs. Uh, so so it's a uh, there's no this whole cooperation it's interesting how how um, in asia they see cooperation in the west it seeks uh, they see cooperation in the west it's uh, aid and cooperation are tied to conditions they are conditions you know i give you a loan but under certain conditions you open your market so i can get my cooperation to you your country and and i can buy state owned assets or I, and I want the democracies that are actually going to the directions of the NATO countries. Uh, in Asia, it's different. You know, I, I, I want to give you an example of the IMF, the World Bank, and the new bank that uh, China created, which is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. IMF and World Bank, you have uh, in the IMF, it's always a European that is at the head of the IMF. In the World Bank, it's uh, an American. U.S. in both banks has veto power, so I mean, talking about democracy, it's not a, you know it's not very democratic. But then the Chinese bank, China is twenty six percent voting right because it's the main investors. 
but it has no veto power. You know, it's it's more like democratic, and everything that is going through that, it's no tight. There is no string attached. It's about doing business. You know, there's no preconditions. It's not about you know like interference of in in a country's affair. You know, you don't want to change countries or you don't want to change a culture, you know, and impose actually Western values or Asian values. No, China is about doing business. And then first prosperity, and then, and then there are lots of good things that are going to come out of prosperity. While in the West, it's the it's a different world, is that we are going to change things. We are, let, let me give you freedom that you cannot eat, Human rights that are my human rights, not your human human rights. You know, I mean, you know, just it's about definition, and and then and and then maybe we'll take care about uh, your prosperity. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, people need to eat first. They need to eat first. They need to have access to education, universal health care. You know, that's what I mean. This is what people want. Uh, it's just factual, you know. Why impose things on people that they they don't need, especially when you are a developing country? When you are develop, developing countries, you have aspiration of of being able to live up to seventy years old. You know, this is an aspiration. You know, you give me freedom, and I'm going to live up to forty years old. What what does it give it to me? You know, you have, I have a, I have a freedom to complain, but in the West you complain, but nothing changed. Exactly. What, what is the point? It's hypocrisy. And and then if you do complain, but in a way that actually endangers uh, all of their rackets, you go to jail immediately. Just look at Julian Assange or uh, Edward Snowden. They would like to put him in jail, or Daniel Hale, who's in jail for exposing uh, how how destructive and murderous the U.S. drone program was. Um, I just want to kind of point that because you were just saying about how how China does not. And first, first of all, people might be skeptical that the SCO won't interfere, but we already have an organization, uh, ASEAN in Southeast Asia. They have a strong non-interference principle and they adhere to it. So they were put under a lot of pressure to meddle in Myanmar and they're not. They're not doing it. And it's driving the West crazy. And I, I have a funny feeling that the SCO is going to work in a very similar way now. This is from The Diplomat. This is a very pro-Western, pro-intervention uh, publication. Does the Belt and Road have a future in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan? And then it says the Taliban will welcome the hard infrastructure elements of the BRI. The soft components are a different story. And they're trying to claim that China is going to impose all of these conditions like women's rights, et cetera, et cetera, on the Taliban. And I, I don't think that they're going to. And they're, the crux of their argument is that because China recognizes women's rights, they're going to insist that the Taliban do likewise. And maybe in relation to Chinese uh, nationals working in Afghanistan, but they're not going to tell the Taliban or the Afghans uh, how to live their life. They don't even have the organizations or institutions to impose that sort of uh, condition on anyone, unlike the US, who has the National Endowment for Democracy and eagerly meddles in everybody's business. Um, so there's all of that. And so right now it's kind of a uh, wait and see what happens. Uh, China is already in Afghanistan. They're already doing business in Afghanistan. They have plans to develop infrastructure. They have a mining project that they've already invested in. And they're working uh, for years now to get, to get going. And really the only thing that's going to hinder it is security. And this is something the U.S. is going to attempt to hold hostage, peace and prosperity in, in Afghanistan by just doing what they always do, destabilizing. We just talked about Myanmar and how the U.S. is essentially fighting a proxy war against China and its, its influence in Myanmar, the relationship between Myanmar and China through these U.S.-backed proxies. Um, one point that I, I will close in on, and I'll give you the, the, the last word, Angelo, and maybe we could keep this at 45 minutes. Uh, information space is extremely important for every nation to protect and control, just like their airspace, their shores, and their borders. And a lot of people don't think about it this way, but it's, this is so key. And in Myanmar, these kids, these opposition movements are completely brainwashed. It's not a case where they came to these uh, ideas on their own, or they, they are pursuing this agenda on their own. This was put into their head 
through decades of US sponsored propaganda, through the NED, through Open Society, through all of these adjacent so-called aid organizations, they have done this to these people. They have disfigured them culturally, psychologically, socially, politically, and now they are at war against their own country. Um, this is not about freedom of speech or freedom of expression. When people get uh, seized by an idea that does not re represent their own best interests or the interests of their country, just like extremism, no one's going to argue that Al Qaeda or ISIS, they have the right to have these views and pursue this, these objectives. They don't. It's not even in their own best interest to do that. Uh, and so this is very important for controlling information space. And I, I just think like it would be really great if countries like Russia and China found a way to export the means to protect information space the same way they, they export the means to protect physical airspace and shores. Uh, through defense, uh, selling defense systems. Uh, Angela, do you have anything else to add about China in Afghanistan, this whole topic about US-China, I would say conflict more so than, than competition? Well, well uh, we need to look at the root of the problem. Why why the, the US went to Afghanistan? I mean, you know, the, the, the excuse, you know, it was a war on terror. And when you look at what are the, they, they never actually, actually asked themselves what is the root of terrorism? Why? Why? It's, it's very simple. It's people are, you know, people are in remote areas. They are poor. There's no prosperity. There's no, there's a low level of education. I mean, keep in mind, you know, that now there's only a, a small percentage of people in Afghanistan that have access to education. So the, the U.S. went in and they went in with weapon and just controlling and trying to change the people. But they didn't take care of the root of the problem which China did in Xinjiang. You know, China was victim of uh, uh, ETIM terrorists, uh, ETIM, which is backed by the US, by the way. And uh, what did they do? They took care of the root of the problems. Why do you have radicals? You know, because people have no prospect for future. When you have no future, when the and and then you have this poor those imams which are Wahhabi funded by by Saudi Arabia by the U.S. which are coming to China and saying, well, you know, uh, let's let's uh, uh, build an Islamic state and so on. And, you know, how you manipulate kids? Uh, in reality, bring them prosperity. I'm no expert. You and I, and we not you know we don't have PhDs, but the, the root of the problem is poverty. People have no future. Uh, so why don't you you bring bring you know some prosperity to people? You build roads, you build infrastructure, you build schools, you build hospitals. With ten percent of the money they spend in Afghanistan, they they would have built a very prosperous nation, and they, it could have it could have been an example. What happened? I mean, nothing. It just made rich the military industrial complex. He, this this war on terror. We are talking about 6.4 trillion U.S. dollar over 20 years time. Talking about 20 thousand dollars per American taxpayers. It was just one of the biggest wealth transfer in human history. You know. So what I want I want to add here is just how the difference between how U.S. is dealing with terrorism and how China is dealing with terrorism. Look at the root of the problem. What you are do, what the U.S. did is actually creating more terrorists. The, those mothers that lost a kid because because of U.S. presence in Afghanistan, she's the most radical. It's going to fuel more terrorism and resentment against the U.S. and it's going to please the military industrial complex because you you need an enemy to to justify one trillion U.S. dollars spent on 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 defense every year and it's not defense i mean we should rename this this is not defense this is attack you know yeah absolutely uh that is a that is a perfect point to close on uh the future of afghanistan is going to be a battle between those waging war against poverty and those waging war in favor of poverty the u.s just spent 20 years in afghanistan demonstrating which side of that battle they're on and now it's China's turn to, to come in there, along with their other S, SCO partners, to try to stabilize and build up uh, Afghanistan to try to uh, replicate the achievements that they've made in Xinjiang, uh, because that's absolutely the reason why the US uh, is against China 
and what they were doing in Xinjiang, not because the U.S. is against surveilling extremists, because they do that and they surveil everyone else, including their own allies, not about detaining because they have Guantanamo Bay detention camp and torture dungeons all around the globe. So they're definitely not upset about China for detaining people. Uh, they're upset because when China detains extremists, uh, they deprogram the, the brainwashing that, that resulted in extremism. Then they give them skills so that they could go rejoin society in a constructive way and have a, a second chance at life, which is better for the public, the general public who are threatened by extremism, and better for that individual. Because uh, just in New, in New Zealand, just recently, there was a, a knife attack and the suspect was under surveillance by the New Zealand police 24 seven. They had an armed team following him around everywhere he went. What did that do to, to help the public? The six people got stabbed and injured and the suspect was killed. So how did that do any good for anyone involved in that case? Uh, if he was deprogrammed, given a skill and reintroduced into society, he would have had a second chance at life. Public would have been safer. The whole country would have done better. So it really is a, a stark contrast between East and West. And uh, Afghanistan is, is kind of a showcase of this. Uh, I want to thank you again, Angelo, for bringing your expertise to this topic. Uh, I, I, I learned something new every, every single time uh, we, we do this. Uh, thank you so much. Everyone who's watching, thank you so much. Uh, check the video description. Again, there's going to be a lot of resources there for people to kind of look into this on their own. There's, there's going to be a lot of information in there. Um, uh, like and share the video. And until next week, uh, bye for now. Thank you.